Good morning. And welcome to the Red Room. And we um, come before you today a few minutes late. We had things we had to take care of. We, I want to remind you that uh, the call to worship that I'm asking you to share in will be put up in the comment section. And the words to the hymns that we will sing will be in there as well. Come to a place of worship. Come to a place of welcome. Enter a time of waiting and watching. Our introit is Emmanuel. to worship gets put up if you would join us in that this morning. How do you feel about shouting a little today? Are good church folk supposed to be shouting? Doesn't sound very dignified. I think it's time to get a little loud about Jesus. He's coming soon, you know. The best part about Advent is is that we get to hear the story again, and we know the wonderful gift that is coming. There are people who haven't heard about that gift. What if they need to hear it from you? What if a whisper won't do? Then, Lord, let us be loud, bold, and quick to tell the good news. We'll be that voice crying in the wilderness. Let's, Let's go, go tell, tell it, it on, on the mountain. mountain. Let's, Let's go, go tell, tell it, it everywhere. everywhere. Our first hymn is Go Tell It on the Mountain. If you have a hymn, we'll turn to page 251 as we sing together.
getting ready to go to prayer at this time. We'd ask you to remember the DeHaven family. Uh, they've suffered a loss in their family. James passed away this week. The funeral will be Wednesday at noon at the Durst Funeral Home. Wednesday at noon. If you have any prayer concerns, you know you can PM them to us, text us, text them to us, and Pastor and I will certainly take it before the Lord. Let's pray. God, we thank you Dear Jesus. for your presence this day. Your word declares that in your presence is fullness of joy. We understand that the joy of the Lord is the strength of your people. Lord, grant your joy. To come to us in the middle of all that's happening in this world. Be with this family right now that's grieving. Keep your hand upon them, O oh Lord. Be with those, Lord. There are so many in the hospital right now. So many suffering from this terrible virus. Touch their bodies. Make them whole. Raise them up for Jesus' sake. God, move upon us today as we hear your word. We're reminded that the psalmist wrote, His word have I hid in my heart yes. that I might not sin against him. We also know that your word declares faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Lord, allow your word to be written on the fleshly tables of our hearts. Lord, we want to live a life that's pleasing to you. Lord, while we're praying for so many who are ill, we pray for those who are ministering to them, to them the doctors, the nurses, Protect. who are standing in the face of all that is happening. Dear. Lord, we pray for our chaplains also at the hospital with what they're doing right now. Lord, we need your strength. Our dependency is upon you. Yes. Lord, as always, we pray for our first responders. Lord, for those who work the ambulances for those on the fire trucks for the police grant O oh lord your hand of protection upon all of them be with our soldiers this day wherever they may be stationed in this world keep your hand upon them we pray for our president we pray for the leaders of this nation and lord we pray for the leaders of our denomination today guide us lord in this troubled times yes. we need you lord more than ever before grant your peace that passes understanding in the middle of the storm we thank you that you're there lord and we pray this prayer that you that you taught your disciples to pray our father who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name, name. Thy, thy kingdom come thy will be done, be done on earth as it is in heaven, heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Don't forget, we'll be coming to you live on Wednesday evening at 7.30. And Pastor will have a study again on Advent. And this, of course, is our second Sunday of Advent. Yes, it is. And we're going to light the candles today also. And, and uh, yes. just like we have been doing from the beginning, we once again are winging it. <laughs> uh-huh. So, well, you got to move so we can put Oh, I have to move. <laughs> yes. You know, she doesn't have the courtesy to say, you know, Harry, you're in the way. But that's all right, honey. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. We understand. Yeah, we do. You'll have to light one here. Our churches have, of course, beautiful sets. And um, we light the first candle from last week. And... It was just impossible to make that happen this week because, once again, we're back in the red room, and I expected to be 
uh, behind the pulpit in Ellerslie. So, our Advent reading, second Sunday in Advent, is about peace. Peace on each step of the journey, and saints, we're on an interesting journey right now, amen? Oh yeah, I forget. As there's somebody out there saying, you know, I can't hear anything she's saying. And that means they didn't hear me insult you at all. Ah, uh, that's all right. Start all over again. Comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God, from Isaiah 40 and 1. Harry, if you would like the second candle, the candle of peace. I'll read from Isaiah 41 through 11 from the New Century Version. Your God says, comfort, comfort my people. Speak kindly to the people of Jerusalem and tell them that their time of service is finished and they have paid for their sins, that the Lord has punished Jerusalem twice for every sin they did. This is a voice of one who calls out, Prepare in the desert the way for the Lord. Make a straight road in the dry lands for our God. Every valley should be raised up and every mountain and hill should be made flat. The rough ground should be made level and the rugged ground should be made smooth. Then the glory of the Lord will be shown and all people together will see it. The Lord himself said these things. A voice says, cry out. And then I said, what shall I cry out? Say, all people are like the grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass dies and the flowers fall when the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are like grass. The grass dies and the flowers fall, but the word of our God will live forever. Jerusalem, you have good news to tell. Go, tell it on the mountain. Jerusalem, you have good news to tell. Shout out loud the good news. Shout it out and don't be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. Look, the Lord God is coming with power to rule all the people. Look, he will bring reward for his people. He will have their payment with him. He takes care of his people like a shepherd. He gathers them like lambs in his arms and carries them close to him. He gently leads the mother of the lambs. And the writer of this lesson says, let us reflect about Isaiah who called the people to get up to a high mountain. For generations, people cried out as Isaiah does, that the paths are crooked, the valleys too far down, the mountains too high. We fear stumbling on uneven stretches of the journey. What if we could see it all from God's perspective? That through it all, God is the eternal source of peace. Do this. Each time you set out on a road or pathway this week, pause and ask God to grant you peace. Driving to work, walking, into the office or a store, taking the dog for a walk. Remember God's promise of peace. And pray with, with me now. God of our journey, whether we walk with purpose or wander without clear direction, whether we are in a valley or on the mountaintop, grant us your eternal peace. And the saints said, Amen. Amen. And I, I want to welcome my friend, Mary, today. Minnesota Mary is here. <laughs> no, it's Minneapolis Mary. No, nope, I live in St. Paul. Oh, you do? Yep. The St. Pauli girl. She's a St. Pauli girl. How about that? You never told me that. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Her address is Minneapolis. No, it is not. <laughs> Isn't it? No. I, I should send you I one I live mail. on the east side of the river. Uh, 
So anyway, like she came a long way oh. to deliver a puppy because I needed another puppy. <laughs> I'm listening for an amen. Amen. Thank amen. You. you don't need another puppy. Well, I'm wait, wrestle with a cannibal, no, so no, sorry. Here, uh, we just lift up the whole thing. It's oh, a I, I, There's yeah. a tray. Yeah, I forgot about the tray. Thank you. So we just okay. having a good time. Uh, it's a lovely, lovely puppy, and we're all excited to have it. And his name is, we're calling him Venture because he's going to be the grand adventure, the great adventure, the great adventure. Adventure or yes. Venture? Well, we're going to call it Venture, but it's because of our, our, our fabulous trip. And so that's going to be his name, the great adventure. Okay, yeah. Venture. Venture. All right. Yeah. I told our I told our Padenko Sparrow that it was her Christmas present. Uh huh. That should be fun. Is that when you sang Happy Birthday to her? No, I sang Merry Christmas. To ah, her. okay. Oh, we should do something. We're I I've, I've lost track of where we're at. You should probably sit down. Well, I will. Yeah. Oh well, maybe not. Ah, wait, I'll stand. Stand up. Because it's, it's time for the scriptures. Okay. We're, we're a little confused today. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. Pure revelation, we are always a little bit confused. So I'll take this card if you bring me the white thing. Yes. Yes, please. Uh, because that will help put it up where it belongs and not scratch the antique piano bench. And you seem to have 25 of those blankets, but that's all right. Sorry about that. <laughs> Not really. Uh, not really. I tell you what, it's been it's been an interesting uh, and extremely busy, and sometimes very frustrating week. And I bet it's been the same way for you. Uh, we've had wonderful things happen. We've had very sad things happen. Uh, of course, we've received some pretty bad news from some of our families, and we all are very aware of the struggle that's going on in a lot of our families. And we ask you to be in very intentional and consistent prayer. And we turn to our scriptures now uh, from Mark 1, 1 through 8, and this is the New Century Version. And the Word of God says, This is the beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as prophet Isaiah wrote, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way from Malachi 3 and 1. This is the voice of one who calls out in the desert. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make the road straight for him. John was baptizing people in the desert and preaching a baptism of changed hearts and lives for the forgiveness of sins. All the people from Judea and Jerusalem were going out to him. They confessed their sins and were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothes made from camel's hair, had a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. This is what John preached to the people. There is one coming after me who is greater than I. I am not good enough even to kneel down and untie his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the inerrant word of the living God. It is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God. Now, where's my little water? Oh, here it is. When you get new puppies, all the other dogs get frisky. So you spend a lot of time telling them to be quiet. So <laughs> it happens. You know I'm right. <laughs> so here we are, and this is our second Sunday in Advent. Advent is the time that we look forward with expectation to the birth of our Savior, to celebrating that. And it's also one of the times 
of the Christian year where we should be taking a good look at ourselves. We should really be contemplating our own personal walk with Christ, really taking stock of things. And this year, as we've mentioned, we find ourselves in a really particularly difficult year for many of us. It's a painful year, a year of unbelievable stress and confusion and challenge and chaos, and for far too many, a year of hard-hitting, unexpected, heart-rending losses. And in the past Advent, the time of not only anticipating the joy of celebrating the gift of the Christ child, but being intentional and focusing on what that greatest gift of all gifts means to us has unfortunately often been completely overshadowed, lost in the turmoil by all the events that we do, the things that we've always done before, the shopping and the baking and the visiting and the traveling and just the busyness of wrapping up gifts and sending out cards and letters. The truth is we have a tendency to let the season take priority over the reason. And this year, much of what we have taken for granted has been torn from us in one way or another. At the least, we've had, many of us have had to set aside meaningful traditions. We've had to learn to shop online, even grocery shop online. We, we sending virtual hugs, and I'm a hugger, that doesn't suit me very well. We, we, we make holiday meals for two instead of 20. We've given up our norms far too often. Even simple social norms, like just simply eating out with friends without hoops and hurdles. And, and we've given up sharing our lives in those ways that really make our lives so much richer and, and so much more beautiful. And the family times... Oh, too many family times have been hindered by caution or by fear or by these changing mandates. And, and we feel cheated by the loss of those deeply needed and longed for times. The times that we join in church, where we hold hands, where we, we pray together and where we're singing together and worshiping together where we're hugging each other and laughing together and working together. Our core corporate experience as a people who worship together and share their faith experience together has taken a horrific twist that has forced us to move into places that are uneasy for us. This is one of those places that's uneasy for us. But be assured Most of us are keenly aware that in the middle of all these other things that are going on and everybody has something, there are many who on top of it all are forced to walk through this time with absolutely broken hearts and damaged lives and the losses that many of us are dealing with are intensified by this breakdown of the support system that we rely on to carry us through those times when the ground seems to have dropped out from underneath us. It's happening too often. The changes that we've had to endure due to this COVID virus are, are more far-reaching than we originally could have imagined. It's causing far more pain and depression and damage to us than was recognized. It's touching everyone, and you need to know that your pastors often feel helpless in the middle of this as well. We feel hobbled. We, we feel like the wind has been knocked out of us, like we've been taken out at the knees. And yet time has moved on. A year has slipped away, and here we are, and it's Advent. And Christmas is coming. It's showing up. 
for the world. The radios are playing Christmas music. The big stores have shelves full of Christmas stuff. Houses are decorated. I even have a tree up this year. Hooray. Yeah, we got it done. We got her done. The presents. But you and Doug got it done. Yeah. Presents are being wrapped all over. Not our, our house. We don't do that. But presents no. are being purchased and wrapped. And You know what? We're all doing what we can, where we can, to try and rise above the whirlwind of chaos around us. And I can assure you that someone, somewhere, is already planning on pork and sauerkraut and black-eyed peas for New Year's Day, just in case. Is that what you have? Ew. Ew. See, she, oh. she's a foreigner. Wait a minute. What <laughs> happened to the lutefisk and the lefsa? Lutefisk and what? Lefsa. Uh, lefsa. Yeah. Okay. It's like a potato tortilla. Ah, uh, ooh. That sounds, <laughs> wait. Potato, <laughs> lots potato of butter. tortilla? Lots of butter. With lots right. of butter. That sounds good. I think maybe we're going to be Swedish this year instead of German. How's that sound? <laughs> Is that Swedish? The Swedish meatballs are good. They'll yeah, make up for yeah. the oh, okay. fish. Yeah, because the fish thing is... You cover it up with white sauce. Uh, <laughs> what she's saying is the fish thing, the fish thing, it has to be covered up. <laughs> That's what I heard. The point is, each one of us in our own way, we're looking ahead. As far ahead as we can, and we're hoping that 2020 isn't repeated in 2021 because we are totally worn out from all of this stuff. We we would like to find, each one of us, a pair of those rose-colored glasses in our stockings on Christmas morning. But Advent, a dear saint's Advent, I'm talking to the saints today. I'm talking today to the Christ followers. It's no better to let the darkness of this year push aside our intentional worship of our Lord and Savior than it was to let it get lost in the rush of holiday happenings that, let's be honest, we've left happen far too often in the past. In fact, I believe that we are as the church, as Christians, as the bride of Christ, we're being shaken to a call for a much deeper look at where we are and who we are. Christ. And we're being honed to move deeper into that relationship, that personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with our Lord. And it has never been more emphatically important to the children of God than it is right now. Such a time as this, those words spring to mind over and over. I believe that we're being shown that in the midst of everything that we do and everything that we find ourselves caught up in and at odds with it, in the end, we really only have one job to do. And even with all the signs waking us to the truth, we're missing the mark. We're too easily diverted. We're still putting our trust and our energy and our priorities into the things of life that, as Christians must always be secondary to the one job we're called to do. John the Baptist understood from his childhood that he had one job to do. Make a way for the light of the world. The very darkness that seems to be pushing into every aspect of our lives right now is the very thing that Jesus came in to the world to defeat. John was called to open the door of people's hearts to that light, to that promise of hope, to that assurance of a different kind of peace. And saints, so are we. Our scriptures today remind us that the event that we celebrate as Christmas was not only longed for and hoped for, it was foretold, it was expected, it happened the way it was supposed to happen, it came when it was supposed to come, it fulfilled every single scripture given about it to the last letter, and yet so many people missed it. The very populace that was praying for it to happen, the very leaders, the priests, the, 
the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, those who should have been there to welcome the event, missed it entirely for the most part. They missed it in spite of the past prophecies, in spite of the announcements from those pesky shepherds, in spite of a new star appearing in a night sky. They missed it in spite of hearing the declaration of his coming from Anna, the prophetess, and Simeon, who had been promised by the Holy Spirit that he would see the Savior before he died. They were looking for a Messiah because they had been told he would come, but they missed the signs that were right before their eyes. They were living in a time in history when their own world offered offered a level of chaos and of fear and control and danger. And yes, diseases that make our current status seem a light burden. Is that why they were blind to the signs that were so clearly given? Wasn't welcoming the Messiah really the one job they had to do? Wasn't everything else they did? And the way they lived and worshipped and studied, designed around that desperately desired promise. How did they miss or dismiss the clear call of a prophet in the desert? Was it because that even though this was a totally expected event, a looked for and a longed for event, that it came in a way that was so unexpected, so different from what they did expect, that it just slipped by the people who were certainly the most sure that they would be able to read the signs. Or was it because of the troubles of the world, the deep pockets of politics, the expectation of returning to the glories in the past clouded their vision? Each of our four Gospels start their story of Christ in a different place. Mark begins his Gospel with the story of Jesus coming to his cousin John, coming down to the Jordan to be baptized. His cousin John, who has been preaching in the wilderness for some time. John who is preaching in a way, in a place, and with a message as the Roman political machine and the John, you see, has a clear handle on the one job he's supposed to do. John isn't a preacher that just shows up, shouts a little, stars up the people, and then with a flourish says, ta-da, and steps back out of the way to reveal the Messiah. Now, he's different. The Bible says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit from childhood. His birth was a big deal. It was announced to his father, a priest, by, by Gabriel himself. His mother was well past childbearing years. Okay, you know her pregnancy stirred up the neighborhood. John the Baptist story was something that was talked about from the first moment of his arrival and his name. They even gave him a name that surprised people. He became a rabbi, a prophet, a wild man. A he had preaching a for himself when he stood on the scene. He had a history already with the people and the local rulers. He had followers. He had a steady stream of seekers. He had enemies. He was already pushing political buttons. It's no accident that he was out in the wilderness. His ministry was calling people to change their hearts and change their lives. He was preparing them for a change in destiny. He was preparing people's hearts for someone who would change the world. And even though his own father was part of the temple hierarchy, giving John the benefits of that kind of extensive education, putting him within reach of the advantages of that kind of system, he, 
His wasn't a call to Jerusalem. He wasn't called to the center of the religious and political power. His was a call for a new exodus. This was a call to become a new people. His very clothing and diet and that unshaven appearance reflected his commitment to the one job he understood that he was called to do. And his followers understood that they, he was a man of the desert and they saw in his mannerisms and his appearance a shadow of the great prophet. And then he had asked himself, is this the one? The one who will make us ready for the Messiah? Because see, they know their scriptures. They know in Malachi 4 and 5, it says, I'll send you Elijah the prophet before that great and terrifying day of the Lord's judgment. And John the Baptist carried an anointing that set him aside. He had a voice and a message that was full of fire that was changing lives and changing minds and drawing people to live differently. It was touching hearts. It was dynamic. It was different. It was authentic. John was compelling and persuasive, radically obedient and faithful. And yet he was so completely outside the box. A complex man who was living the simplest type of life and yet seen as a great man. He was honored. He was held in high esteem by the people. A man marked as a true prophet by the multitudes that had gone out to hear him. And yet it was this man who said he wasn't even worthy to untie the sandal from the foot who, of the one who's coming after him. John says this one to come is so great that he, John, is less than a slave to him because even a Hebrew slave wasn't required to untie his master's sandal. John is preparing hearts and making a way for a Messiah who will not be what they're looking for. A king who won't usher in a world of order and control. A king that won't defeat the Romans and reinstate the Jewish kingdom. It's going to be a different kind of kingdom. Because it's a different kind of king. It's one, in fact, that even John himself wasn't prepared for. It'll be a king that'll shake up people and show them that they can't depend on being an ancestor of Abraham as a free ride to, to heaven. They're going to have to step in to a completely new relationship with God. It'll be a Messiah who will unveil the kingdom of God to those who will believe. A kingdom unlike anything they were ready for. And it'll be a man who John is preparing hearts for, this son of the living God, this chosen one who will touch leopards and feed the hungry and heal the sick and, and stoop down and not only remove his disciples' sandals, but wash their feet. What a job John had to do. He only had one job. And it was imperative that it predominate everything else. What a responsibility. And what luck that he had the Holy Spirit to help him. Am I right, saints? To help him, to lead him, to empower him, to enable and authorize him to get the message of Christ out into the world. Wouldn't it be great if we had that? And isn't that the one job we're called to do? It is. If you're a Christian, if you're a child 
of the King, a follower of Jesus Christ, you have one job that supersedes everything else you do. And that is to go and make disciples of Jesus Christ. And the good news is, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, we do have it. We have everything that John had. And we have more than he had. We have an indwelling of a, that spirit. We have the assurance of the resurrection. We have the rest of the story. One of the reasons that we celebrate Christmas is because we have seen Easter. We have the promise that John is introducing fulfilled. John's telling people that the Messiah, Messiah is coming soon. He's telling people to get ready, to change their hearts, to be prepared. He's a voice crying out because people needed to hear the good news so they could receive the king. It was John's one job. And it is still our one job. Amen. Because saints, we know, don't we? Soon and very soon. Mm -hmm. Oh, we love that song. Soon and very soon. Our Lord is coming again. Should we dare not lose sight of the fact that our one job is to keep opening hearts to him so that he might enter them right now? We are to be a go tell it on the mountain. I'm sitting on the side of Will's Mountain. Hallelujah. We're a mountain people. We ought to understand this. We know how mountains work. We know how the echoes roll down the hills. We are to go tell it on the mountain. We're a go tell it on the mountain kind of people. Because for those who haven't heard about him, who haven't repented and received him, He's still out there, still seeking to save, longing to save, calling people to come. And they still need the good news. So actually our one job is to be a John the Baptist. Our one job is to cry out in whatever wilderness we find. Because if you are still without Jesus, you are in the wilderness. You're separated from God. You're, you're lost in a tangle that needs a straight road. And our one job is to proclaim the kingdom of God, to proclaim Jesus as Lord and Savior, to proclaim that each person must prepare the way in their own heart for Jesus. He's coming soon. That's that old saying, he's coming soon to a theater near you <laughs> and to a school near you and to a shopping mall near you, to your workplace near you, to a neighbor near you. He's coming to a heart that's near you. He's coming soon and he wants you to be his light, his mouthpiece, his announcer. And he's done everything. He's provided everything that we need to be the witnesses that he calls us to be. He is the Almighty One, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And yet, he calls us to be the ones to proclaim the good news. What a humbling privilege that is. Christmas is coming. Christ is coming. And until the trump sounds, dear saints, you have one job. Are you ready to be a voice in the wilderness? I do pray that you are. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, you have asked us to be a prophet, a preacher, a wild man of the desert. And it seems like such a daunting task, but you prepared each of us. 
to go into a different part of this world's wilderness with the good news. To give us the heart to speak your words, to love your people, to follow your leading, and to show the way. And we ask all things in that name that is above all names, Jesus to Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What pages are closing him on? Uh, 158, if you have a hymnal. I love to tell the story. It's a great song. It is. 156. I have a clip over it. 156. 156. Yes. We do love to tell a story. Yes, indeed.
telling the story when you make up your mind this is what I'm called to do this is where I need to go this is what God is asking me to do he will open doors he will put people in your way one on one we had had so much joy touching people one on one there's somebody somebody who needs to hear from you and you need to ask yourself every day, every day, what did I do? Who did I tell the story to today? Amen? Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord let his peace settle on you. His favor surround you and may that Holy Spirit fire rise up in you. and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God willing, and the creek don't rise. <laughs>